Good evening, everyone, and a special welcome to those joining us online. We are here this evening to continue our Sean O'Marku public lecture series as part of ACE's 75th anniversary celebrations. Sean O'Marku was appointed the first departmental director of ACE in 1967, holding this position until 1990. Under his leadership, ACE saw a period of considerable expansion to the course offering right across Munster. In 1969, Sean Amarco was instrumental in the founding of AMSIS, Ireland's National Adult Education Association, and served as its chair for a number of years. This public lecture series seeks to celebrate Sean Amarco's contribution to ACE by continuing his ethos of outreach and accessibility to learning. That brings us to this evening's event. We are delighted to welcome our colleague and friend, Dr. Steve O'Brien, to join us this evening. Before joining UCC School of Education as a lecturer, Steve worked in ACE as a senior researcher in the early noughties, so we're delighted to be collaborating with him again. Uh, Steve has published widely on adult education, educational inclusion, educational policy, curriculum and assessment, critical pedagogy and learning theory. Um, I'm sure we're all very excited to hear about Steve's uh, latest research, so we hand over to you. Thank you, Lindsay. Thank you. And uh, good evening, everybody, and good evening, welcome everybody here and online. And a uh, special thank you to Lindsay and to Dr. Shiro Sotuma for the invite, and to Matthew and Norni and all colleagues in ACE who welcome me back after a number of years of uh, absence. And uh, Lindsay was just saying there that I had uh, come back from England as a school teacher at the time, and uh, I came back to Adelaide then where I worked with Martino Fahi. And uh, I always had very fond memories of my time in Adelaide, okay? and all the people I met, the learners and the teachers and the community educators. Um, and and uh, it's great to be here with you this evening. So, what I want to talk about tonight, if I may, um, I want to talk about, and I have to get up to do this because I don't have a clicker. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the background and context of this talk tonight, and it really emerges from uh, a wider study um, that myself and Professor Fred Powell, Dr. Martin Galvin, and Dr. Tim Rudd uh, did on behalf of SOLAS, it's an independent study, but SOLAS had asked us, the training agency in Ireland had asked us to write a report uh, outlining some key theoretical and philosophical foundations that they can be guided by into the future. And we were delighted and honored to do that work. And it will be coming out very soon. I want to highlight that with you now tonight that it, uh, this talk really comes out of that work. And uh, I'd like to thank people in SOLAS that helped us with that as well. And the Weather the Wire, the assistant manager there, and colleagues around the country in adult education, particular mention to Bernie Crum in Maine University, and to Kerry Face, professor of education in the University of Bristol, amongst many others that we collaborated with in that project. So this talk comes from that, and um, what I specifically want to highlight really is the fact that tonight's talk is on Irish history in further education and training, but in that bigger report there's also a comparative study with uh, fit systems in England, in Denmark, in Germany, and in Finland. And it's also informed by critical theory, and uh, for us, critical theory really uh, going back to the foundations of the Frankfurt School in Germany and the work of Max Horkheimer, Theodorno, uh, Herbert Marcuse, and majorly uh, Jürgen Habermas. We really looked at critical theory as the framework through which this report could be written um, and the need for a greater understanding of an emancipation from particularly oppressive structures in society, which is so central to adult education. And the term critical here is not to be understood in the global sense of being negative or obstructionist, but rather uh, as a way of which to hold power uh, to critique, uh, to make systems like the education system a bit better, and in turn to advance democratic values in society. And that's where we're coming from, really, from a critical theory perspective. Um, and just to say that critical theory has epistemological. Uh, ideas attached to it, such that so we can see knowledge is something to be contested, it's something to be fought for, and we look for different ways of thinking and doing, but we also look to the identity question in the critical theory, that it actually uh, formulates for us new ways of being, 
uh, with one another. And so we're very influenced, I think, by uh, critical theorists and talk about humanism and the idea of education being central to social relations. And we're also influenced uh, by the axiological qualities, a big word in philosophy, I suppose, just meaning the values attaching to critical theory, which is really different ways in which we value uh, the education enterprise uh, in community. So really, as well as talking about what kinds of knowledge this effect is still, we should also be talking about what kinds of identities, what kind of moral questions does it bring up for us, and what kind of a profession do we want to be, and who it is we stand with, and why it is we stand by particular ways of doing and doing. And so critical theory brings all of that for us into play. And um, just to elaborate a little bit further on that, uh, we really take what's called a bricolage approach to critical theory because critical theorists, I suppose, if you brought them all into one room, they wouldn't necessarily agree with one another. You know, they're coming from different perspectives uh, and their own traditions and their own knowledge systems, etc. Uh, but we take a bricolage approach to it, which is uh, you know, the Levi Strauss idea of bricolage is something that works, it's to hand, it's a practical thing to do, to take different perspectives that um, can have meeting points. And Joe Kinchlow also talks about the importance from a transdisciplinary point of view, bringing all these different perspectives together, but bringing us somewhere else because of that richness, because of that depth and variety. And so we draw on uh, Pierre Bourdieu's work, uh, many sociologists will, will know Pierre Bourdieu's work, and particularly the idea that some people in life, their life experiences, their biographies are shaped by their habits, their family environments, their neighborhood, the, uh, the benefits of social relations and social capital networks that they may have. Economic capital is very important as well, having the resources and the means to buy, uh, to own, to have access to. Um, goods, uh, educational goods such as library access and books and equipment, you know, CT terms, etc. And uh, I suppose cultural capital ultimately as well, and how we walk the education system and, and make it beneficial to us, um, and ways in which we can think differently uh, with the support of others. So Pierre Bourdieu's work is very important um, in our study, and in the report there's a great outline of that. Um, and there's also influences of post structuralism, which is the idea that really we're beyond the band normative uh, ideas of family, um, traditional view of what a family is or what a, a, a particular person uh, has by way of their attributes or their characteristics. And we break that down and talk about post structuralism, uh, looking at how there's intersectionality between class, between gender, between race and ethnicity. And we look at post-colonial theory and know that history is often written by those in, in particular advantaged positions and others that they've written out, whether they're working class uh, communities, whether they're women's groups, whether they're particular race, ethnicity groups, uh, travel groups, etc. Um, and we look to post-colonial theory for putting history right, and to put manners on history sometimes though it's narrated down to us. And we talk about other voices and the importance of an ethical relationship difference in particular. In the educational realm, we talk about critical pedagogy, which is a way of doing education which is different for different groups of people, like non-traditional other learning groups, for example, may demand non-traditional ways of teaching and learning. And so we talk about co-constructing and designing curricula, assessments, uh, and, and doing things differently, uh, other than transmission, other than content-only work. Uh, and talks about maybe creative methodologies, uh, critical pedagog uh, pedagogies, and so on. And we look at feminist pedagogy. We could have looked at queer pedagogy. We could have looked at different groups, other groups, disability groups, for example. And we know that the list is not exhaustive that you see here in front of you. But we, we argue that really it brings together a different way of seeing adult education, which is bound up in this kind of critical pedagogy idea. Um, which draws on the theory of adult learning that's expressly informed by critical theory perspectives. So we go back to Malcolm Knowles' concept of andragogy that adult learners actually engage in different ways of doing and being. Um, and they have an aptitude for self directed learning, although that can be taken too far. We need a lot of support as well and support around them. And obviously, the idea of developing critical literacy 
and empathy and so on. And so this kind of bricolage approach came together in the report and uh, it kind of gave us a way of explaining the phenomena around FET and FET history in a particular way. And just to highlight, I suppose, four key ideas that emerge through the bigger report. And I'm only highlighting this because uh, the talk really only looks at one aspect, but uh, four big ideas emerge uh, from our report. And one of those is uh, the notion of opportunity pluralism, which is what Professor Joseph Fishkin uh, helps us to think differently about inequalities in education and society, and enables us to think critically about uh, opportunities and disadvantaged uh, disadvantage and how that's actually structured and mediated, often unintentionally through system bottlenecks and largely unitary routes of access. So it suggests that the concept of equality of opportunity is based upon a systemic fairness, whereby it's presumed that everybody is given an equal chance. We've already talked about poor due and maybe how people have different access to different forms of capital and how capital accumulation rather than redistribution seems to be the natural order. And uh, Fishkin talks about the idea uh, that there has to be different ways in which we operationalize multiple diverse evolving routes to participation and access and outcomes. So not just the unitary route. And I suppose we can look at HE access an example, higher education access. There's 60% of our young people are going to university and ask why and is this uh, uh, equal opportunity for all, even amongst the 60% that do go. Uh, and uh, so on. So we look to democratic participation is another key idea in the report, and this is the idea that we have to create democratic learning environments, and education should be part of a coherent vision that not just speaks about democracy, but teaches through democracy. So in adult education, we're well, comfortable with co-designing assessments and curricular constructs with learners, for example. We are comfortable with dialogues and circles of dialogues and how the talks about it. Public affair about knowledge that's contested, not given and handed down, etc. And this is a central part of democratic participation because if you experience it, you're more likely to practice it, you're more likely to be a better uh, democratic uh, oriented person, and critical literacy helps you along the way. Um, in the report, also, I just want to highlight the technologies mentioned, and of course, coming out of a pandemic, uh, if we are indeed coming out of a pandemic. It has shown us, of course, our reliance on ICT, and we know that some groups have suffered more than others in that space, uh, particularly groups who not only needed the equipment to do work, to do learning, but also ways in which they can enable that culturally, how to operate in the educational sense. And that's a challenge that's, that's there. And in the report, we argue against techno romanticism. We talk about that supply of equipment is not enough. It's also about the accessibility of that equipment, the ways in which we learn differently through ICT. And there's opportunities there that it needs to be critiqued nonetheless and, and not seen as a panacea. Um, and finally, we talk about sustainability, the environment, and climate change, and how the Irish debt sector in particular is well placed to be a progressive leader and enable a radical change in this moment. We argue for a sort of climate emergency education strategy um, that's, that's a new pledge on the part of the institutions. Um, help change mindsets and the practices of learning on site and exercising and mapping uh, new movements, networks, sustainable industries, companies, community groups, third sector organizations, and governmental departments around this pledge. And so that's all to be found in the main report, which is soon to be published by SOLUS. I don't have an exact date for that, but I just want to give you that rather uh, deep background in context of the report. Uh, and what I want to talk about tonight really is where have we come from uh, in Ireland in terms of our FET history, the chronicle of FET uh, system. And uh, maybe we can learn from the lessons because history as a foundational subject is a way of, if you like, censoring the present, guiding the future. And without learning from the past, we are going nowhere. We need to be guided from that. And uh, I think sometimes it means avoiding doing similar things, but other times it might be recasting it in a new image. In fact. And some of these lessons have come through our research in looking at the history of the fetch. So let's have a look at this. Um, and before I do so, I want to just draw attention to one very important concept 
And the concept comes from our good colleague, Professor Dennis O'Sullivan, uh, who uh, really is such a, a weighty theorist, uh, a fine mind and a great practitioner over the years. And uh, we really want to honor his work tonight because his work on policy paradigms has been so instrumental to how it is we look at history. I suppose history is not going to be seen as a chronicle of events one after another, almost linearly in, in, in situ. Uh, rather, uh, this idea of policy paradigms talks about uh, something wider. It talks about educational policy you know, being neutral, for example, uh, which he holds us to interrogate it and critique it. And it offers us a way in and around policy texts, statutes, decrees, wider cultural science, and really talk about the consequent material effects on the ground. And uh, Dennis O'Sullivan's work um, is what looking at. Uh, and his, his, the title of his book, if people are interested in, is Cultural Politics and Irish Education Since the 1950s, Policy Paradigms and Power. And what Dennis reminds us is that policy paradigms are cultural frameworks. They're basically constructed. Uh, they govern the policy process. They embody linguistic. There's particular language attaching to policy over the years. There's particular knowledge, epistemic features of policy. There's normative judgments made over the years, such as uh, governments espousing or telling us, say, ought, and using words like ought or should. Uh, uh, there's a filiation of procedural ways in which change happens. So, this really tells us that when policy gets to be put in place, something is seen as a problem, a meaningful problem. As Carl Backley talks about the Australian academic. What's the problem represented to be in policy? There's a particular problem. It could be about adult literacy, it could be about numeracy, it could be digital literacy, for example, as a problem that's being made. And all of this then is considered worthy uh, to be uh, described, uh, data to be attached to it, and to be recognized as legitimate and ultimately enacted. And so, in effect, what Dennis O'Sullivan is asking us to do is to reflexively gauge and uh, look at history and find our path in it, walk our way around all of this change, um, and to see if maybe how power was enacted in ordinary practices that come out of policy. So we may talk about the concept of human agency here, and we may say, well, you know, policy can be instituted, but it doesn't mean that I am always going to be owned by that policy. Where's my agency? This is always a debate there between policy that's instituted and where we are in it. And for example, if there's policy that's aimed at performativity or confidence, where are we? Does it mean that we just follow it or are we agentic? And what's made that question more problematic of late has been the, the onset of uh, uh, misinformation and disinformation and unreality and our hold of reality. And somewhere along the line, we're carried along with these historic events and we use the language of the day. And uh, in some ways, we act out the sign of the appearance of the policy in some way. We animate it, we generate it, we, we generate it from below, as we call it. Say. Power really does come from below, it's not always from on high. It's how it's generated by individuals in their institutions, for example. So, how authentically agentic can we be given all of this, uh, given that there's a constant dominance, circulation of truths, untruths, and signs? So this is all in keeping with critical literacy, of course, and the function of adult education, that we need to be critically literate in our times. We need to be critically independent of thought and mind, even if the power and circulation of truths out there are quite strong, we, we still need to find our way in adult education as a particular critical part of some of that. So, I just want us to be aware of the policy paradigm concept as we speak through each of the epochs now uh, that we identify as the significant eras of adult education through particularly further education uh, from colonial times to present time. Let's have a look at colonial times first, okay? Okay, so this, this could be considered epoch one, if you like, and uh, you know. I'm sure there are historians amongst us who will argue about the exact dates. Was it 1825 and 1923? We should stop that. Or where were we with this? How definitive is technical education in this? And 
I suppose what we're trying to say is that no harm in fact dates with it. Nonetheless, there are significant events within these epochs that we want to draw attention to. We want to find out what would the science, what would the power of stuff that ages, the truths that age and the power are represented at that time. Um, and just going back to colonial times, we may look at today the National Education Board and the National Education System was established in Ireland, then in the country, in 1831. That was 40 years before it happened in India. Uh, and as the pictorial image represents there, Catholic youth were educated often in this time via clandestine head schools, which largely emerged in response to a notion of public appetite for education. It's very important that we understand that education is part of the fabric of the people of Ireland. It's not necessarily system-led, of course. When it was system-led, established uh, in 1831, it was particularly uh, there to uh, promote particular cultural and national identity questions, or at least prevent particular cultural and national identity questions as well. Um, but people understood at that time the necessity of education, and they went to great efforts to make sure that their young people did become educated, the better ones served ones found. So it's very much in our DNA. And, uh, I suppose the Catholics by the British government at that time, they had a denial to their right to education and the penal laws were at that play there. But the Irish national school system, according to Fleming and Harford, really was a means for Britain to control its nearest colony and promote Protestantism, the English language, and the English culture. And this new national school system emphasized the emphasis of the three R's, but it also incorporated manual instruction, such as needlework, woodwork, and agriculture, that often responded to local training needs. And here we find the first source of training metaphor at work. And at that time as well, the Intermediate Education Act was at play in 1878. And uh, that was a payment by results system. So there was three exams at that time in post primary secondary, the first to the end of the first year, the end of the third year, the end of the fifth year. And schools were paid in accordance with their results. Irish was not on the equation at that time, nor was religion, Catholic religion in particular, of course. Uh, it's interesting to think that payments by results in this early form of performativity happened back then. And we have another form of performativity argument now, which we talk about those historical similarities and continuations to that later on. Um, but the post primary sector was originally class based, um, catering mainly for the landowning Protestant population, um, though there were Catholic schools that did engage as well. Um, and there was a clear symbolic capital going back to Bourdieu distinction between a liberal form of education, that of its lower vocational technical counterpart. And at this time, this was no different to other colonial nations, such as in India. Shakti Purura talks about that, where liberal education was deemed essential to access the civil service occupations, for example, of the empire, uh, and in this case, selective university education, very selective university education. So there was a status divide between liberal and vocational forms of education going way back, and that would characterize Irish education right up to the present day. The difference between liberal education and vocational forms of education. Now in 19, sorry, in 1893, the Technical Education Association of Ireland, the establishment of the Technical Instruction Act of 1889 was there, and the focus was on technical science to industry instruction over and above manual labor market or trade uh, or trades at that time. So as well as having a particular technical or industrial related focus, education was to be administered in Ireland, relocating from the science and art department in London at that time via the new Department of Agricultural and Technical Instruction, DATI in Dublin. As training was partly funded by local rates, administered by local authorities, local representatives and local authority members would eventually form part of the membership of training boards from across the country. To this day, that's in existence with the old BBC committees and the ETV structure that local governance issue happened as far back as the colonial times. Um, and I just want to draw attention to the slide. And in this case here, you'll see that uh, the voluntary education sector was also aligned with well, the Gaelic Athletic Association, the Gaelic Union, the Irish Agricultural Organization Society, United Irish Women, and you can see a common thread here in these voluntary community organizations is the Gaelicization attempt by the people through voluntary organizations, often in response to a system that was doing differently. 
Uh, interestingly, the first technical institute school was in chemistry in Dublin, and that's now where um, the University of Dublin is now. It's a technological University of Dublin, or DIT, with 28,000 students presently to this day. Um, okay, that humble beginning in chemistry. Okay, so looking at then a second epoch, Janice Sullivan would refer to this as the theocratic policy paradigm. Um, and by 1922, with the new formation of the Free State, vocational technical, technical education is about to change. Gerard Looney notes how this fledging government had to focus on the economic needs of the country and specifically provide for a new skilled labour workforce that would undertake major infrastructural projects. Responsibility for Fed transfer in 1924 from the Department of Agriculture to the Department of Education. And it was almost a symbolic act to move it away from an agrarian view or a typified view of Ireland as an agrarian society to now the Department of Education that happened in 1924. The then Minister of Education, Professor John Marcus O'Sullivan, established an expert commission to advise upon a system of technical education in specific response to the requirements of trade and industry. And the commission's report was published in 1927, and as Looney reports, it segregated technical education into three categories. Continuation, we provide large on a full-time basis for 14 to 16 year olds. Technical education to describe employment related work including apprenticeship training, and higher technical education to describe the training of technical managers in mechanical and electrical work, and which could be used to train teachers as well. So at this point, really the education economy relation was brought closer together. Um, that the work of the firm of education was to really serve the needs of the economy at this point. And this too would characterize actually Irish education to the present day. Um, the era of church control, what Dr. Sullivan refers to as the theocratic policy paradigm, characterized the aim of education as a settled matter to be determined by the unchanging principles based on a Christian view of human nature and destiny. And Glanton, you know, Glanton who does excellent work in this area, Cites O'Reilly noting that the 1930 Vocational Act represented a significant turn because the state now asserted its responsibility for education. Vocational education committees, 38 in total at the time, were put in place, comprising both technical and continuation forms. And the Act proclaimed the state's and not the church's responsibility for vocational education, uh, which was designed to directly respond to trade and industry needs in Ireland. And if we look at this slide above here, you notice that the Catholic Church was still involved, even though the state, if you like, took responsibility for vocational education because of the uh, it, it really prohibited VCs from delivering general education to avoid competition with its own religious post primary schools. And in fact, as you see from the quote below, the result was that vocational schools were often seen as second class, literally to the existing secondary school system. Duncan reports the snobbish element in the Republic, many among the ranks of shopkeepers, tended to look down on vocation schools as only suitable for the poor and working classes. The thing about history is it's not just events. People get caught up in this. People's lives are caught up in this. So somebody who was pursuing a technical future would have been exposed to prejudices in society versus those who are following a liberal education model. The question to ask is, well, what is the historical lesson here? Do we think differently still of vocational schools versus classical liberal forms of education? Just at a point from Mr. Singh in the 1940s of Alfred O'Reilly, champion that of education, of course, the UCC at this point, and extramural classes were arranged in Ireland, and we're very proud of that particular uh, element of that story in this epoch. The economic crisis in the 50s, however, meant there was little appetite for a widespread change in system coherence, though more striking change appeared in the next epoch, which we're about to see. Okay, this third epoch we can refer to as the human capital policy paradigm, and roughly between the years 1960 to 97. Thomas Kenneth, Kenneth Whitaker, T.K. Whitaker, eminent civil servant, economist, politician, diplomat, is often credited with playing a critical role in the history of Ireland's economic development. Newland Landon notes how in 1958, 
particularly with her published Economic Development, which led to the first program of economic expansion in 1958 to 63. This signaled a clear move away from a protectionist economic policy towards a more expansive uh, expansionist economic strategy. In 1960, Ireland, for example, sought to enter into the uh, European Economic Community, though it did not uh, gain affiliation status until 1973. In 1961, however, Ireland participated in an Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, OECD, conference in Washington, and in 1962, it officially joined the group. This was a particularly momentous moment for Irish education, notes John Coolin, the eminent historian. In 1965, the OECD's Investment in Education report was published. It signaled significant post primary structural reform as well as expansion of technical education and curriculum provision. Now, crucially, the OECD report embedded the education economy relation by fixing the dependency of economic reform and uh, developing on this necessary education reform. So, education had to change in response to economic reform. The report also implanted the language of educational outcomes. We might refer to them now as outcomes in contemporary times. But that happened in 1965. Sullivan refers to this transitional period in Irish education as a shift from the dominant theocratic policy paradigm to a mercantile paradigm. In effect, this represented a shift away from the primacy of personal moral development in adult education towards the dominant concern for human and capital values. The clear, unambiguous rules tackle this advantage and enhance equal opportunities were set forth. Investing in human capital, in people, and in their education was seen in an investment in one's own social mobility and in one's national economy, putting on the green jersey. So let's have a look at that first point. What happened was Ireland was not working on its own, it was working in concert with a coalescing of powerful international agencies. We might call this a kind of a supranational cooperation at this point between the World Bank, the IMF, and OECD. And this would assemble to effectively and affectively. What I mean by affectively there is it sets out particular triggers of emotion and feelings and aspirations and desires, as well as the effects on the ground. It's really how we should be thinking, if you like. Uh, and that would shape Irish education and secure, particularly, this education economy common sense. Of course, one is educated compared to what it was seen to be the affective force that would be produced. And, uh, arguably, of course, is still a strong today. Um, so perhaps at this point, it's just to say that not all of this was kind of human capital only as well, because without all of these impacts, there were countervailing forces. There was highly social progressive change happening at this time. And the picture that you see uh, on screen, of course, is of Donald Manning, the Limerick Minister of Education in 1967, who introduced free primary schooling and free school transport. A most revolutionary social progressive change that happened in Ireland, possibly to this day the biggest ever. And as a result of it, the number of 15 year olds in full time education increased from 50% in the early 60s to 70% by 1970, 85% by 79, and 97% by 1990. Uh, I don't have the current figures on that, that's an NSC uh, figure, but quite phenomenal uh, the change. And it, it changes the economic capital imperative and access routes for those that cannot. Uh, and, and I suppose it makes the, the claim for education as a civil right and, and equal opportunities, genuine equal opportunities, where money, uh, unlike other systems, education systems in the world, particularly the states here in particular, uh, do not follow that egalitarian model. Okay? Uh, in 1968, the Higher Education Authority was set up. On an ad hoc basis, 69, the Institute of Training and Development was set up. The National Adult Learning Learning Organization, ANTUS, was established in 1969. Sean Murray, his lecture series here, Director of Adult Education, of course, was also chair of ANTUS for a number of years. Uh, and in 1970, regional technical colleges, you remember that title? The regional technical colleges were set up and established under BBC control. I think the point to make here is the state asserts asserted kind of a centralized state control here at this point. They were beginning to find their feet, find their voice, uh, administer and govern from the center. And, and via devolved power structures and increased commitment to active inclusion training measures would characterize Irish vocational education provision in the country. This concept of active inclusion is really interesting from history. 
if you go back and you create create the first epoch that we talked, you go back to pattern dates where people uh, have to walk their way in order to get built, uh, building roads to nowhere, for example. That was a form of active inclusion. The only way that you're going to get today is if you walk, even if the walk itself is needless, cruel, or necessary. Active inclusion uh, as a concept is really historically been in somewhere, and it is a colonial effect. Post-colonialism allows us to question that actually and to wonder whether or not active inclusion needs to be further problematized. And we can talk about present day connections to active inclusion as well in the conservation context. At that time as well, uh, myself and Lindsay were talking about this, uh, the interim and final monthly reports were done in 1970 and 73, as well as the later Kenny report in 1984. And it, at that time, it sought to distinguish adult education from any other life, lifestyle, or lifestyle, life stage provision. In those reports, they especially emphasized the permanent, or in maybe in present parallels, we might call it lifelong status of wide-ranging informal as well as formal education activities undertaken by adults and they saw wider public and policy consultations on matters structural for example hosting adult education facilities systemic the need for literacy supports methodological applying appropriate methods for adult learning instruction and these reports also emphasize the importance of human potentiality self-fulfillment Paid educational leave and the provision of an education in the true sense of the term. They also warned against the myopic focus on specialized mechanical skills. These were reports of the 70s and 80s, and that was of their time. Now, many of the reforms were not implemented, but it's interesting to see how lifelong learning is cast. In these very important documents. From 1977 onwards, the European Social Fund was instrumental in funding and established pre employment courses in vocational schools as well as comprehensive community schools. Youth Reach was established in 89. Vocational Training Opportunity Scheme or VFOS was also in place, as were post leaving certificate programs. NALA was formed in 1980, community education, women's education, second chance, disadvantage focused education, continuing education were all evolving in this period. So it wasn't all that unidirectional focus towards human capital. In fact, it was a contested policy arena, a contested space where arguments around what in lifelong learning were happening. And there were different progressive movements, and there were different, if you like, interested groups, particularly industry related groups, arguing their cases. So policy is never univocal, it's always multi dimensional, struggle oriented, contested, and so on. An example of that industry related interest happened in 1992 with the Connaughton Report. That was the work of the Industrial Policy Review Group, chaired by industrialist Jim Connaughton. And it stressed the need for Irish industry to be more competitive, reduce its costs, make quality and technological improvements, and move progressively into so called higher productivity industry and segments. Consequently, the relevance and effectiveness of education and training came back into focus. And in 1995, the White Paper on Education, uh, Charting Our Education Future, was published. It set out plans to develop a further education agency. It didn't happen for a number of years later, so us. Now, the Fund for Training Agency, which was established in 2013, and it also recommended the Unified Irish National Certification Authority, TASTIS, as it was called, now QQI. I want to turn to the third point on this slide that will further develop this epoch argument that significantly from the white paper, the term further education, which we now use, appeared for the first time. And it appeared as an all encompassing term for the adult education provision. So it subsumed, if you like, or assumed community education and all the other developments that were happening contemporaneously. Further education became an all encompassing term. Thank you. It goes back to that time. Now it's clear during this third epoch there were many social progressive advances in education. I go back to Donald O'Malley in 1967. But at the same time, it's defined by the ascendancy of the education economy relation, most clearly manifest in the priority supported to human capital investment, as well as educational outputs that 
fixed training skills to new industry demands. Let's find out what happened in EPOC 4. Okay, again, we may argue about the dates. We may even argue about the title of this epoch. Uh, for this, we refer to the neoliberal policy title, which is vocational education from 1970 to 2020. And in 1997, an OECD publication entitled The International Adult Literacy Society identified that one in four, 25% of the sample of Irish adults, scored at the lowest level one in literacy which meant that their capacity to perform at best the most simple literacy tasks, such as a reader locating a single piece of information in a text, uh, would not be in place. For the 32% of other learner samples go to level two, a level considered to be inadequate to fully participate in daily life. Langton notes how this international survey not only focused minds on the need to appreciate the economic and broader social and well-being benefits of literacy provision, it also led to the funded development of a new national, national adult literacy strategy as recommended in the report. In the same year, the first minister of state for adult education was appointed, that was in 1997, and in quick succession, we had the 1998 education uh, framed within a lot of legislation, the 1999 Qualification Act set up the framework for the NQAI, the NQAI, the 2000 Education Welfare Act, the BEC Amendment Act, the Youth Work Act, the Teaching Council Act, and the White Paper on Adult Education. So I know a lot of legislation in this. And here is what looking at, as, as Luke Murcha, the historian, writes, demonstrated that the government was unwilling or unable to reconcile the competing interests of the Department of Enterprise, Trade and Employment, and its executive agency force at the time, with those of the Department of Education and Science. So you had a real policy, um, you had, I suppose, the white paper representing the skills agenda and representing adult education in the holistic sense in the same document. And they weren't quite reconciled, brought together somehow. Um, communication with one another. They remain, I suppose, With the 16 ETVs that came from the 33 Vs, if you know what I mean, in this, in this common environment now, we have the first ever integrated annual services plan which relates to further education training, where the 16 ETVs would account for the type, 
mix and the volume of programs we deliver, as well as estimated outcomes and targets that we feed back into the National Faith Services Plan. Ireland then had, for the first significant time in its adult education history, including practice, a coherent set of neoliberal means and perspectives were, that were to be advanced and supervised by new hierarchical managerial structures. This goes back to Foucault, and go back to our critical theory of perspectives that power comes from below. It comes through practices. It's not, if you like, repeated from a sermon, uh, uh, necessarily are owned by people in their heads or in their bodies and their actions. It's actually done in procedures, in practices. So one has to produce an enemy services plan. One is implicated in that. There's a role in the task. There are people assigned to it. There are values espoused in meetings about it. There's a priority set on it. There are power structures around it. All of which goes back to Dennis Sullivan's idea of the policy paradigm. That it's not just an event, it's something that happens, but rather implicates people in social relations and in practices, often from below, actually, not from above. So we write into culture, we write into practice that which is effectively put out there are instituted in some way, or given to us by way of practice. Now, the Celtic Tiger years, didn't we all party? Uh, 1995 to 2007, during this time, the Public Service Management Act happened in 2004, enabling new managers in the institutionalizing of market principles and governance into culture. It was also put under the, the guise of rationalization. But rationalization measures as um, the Zulu talks about, of course, is often characterizing this reconstituted neoliberal period because it places on public and public services a heavy responsibility for the failures of the market. And thus, a traditional market solution, rationalization, is entrusted to solve a market failing, which is risk induced. And, and this comes into effect and has a doubling down impact on an already under resourced education system. And during this time of reconstitution, is increased investment in labor market activation initiatives as training and work experience skills in the hope that these would act as key leverage to combat unemployment and mass immigration. And there was a doubling down in the education economy relation at this point as crisis management almost determined. More and more emphasis was placed on activation and skilled measures. Luke Martin notes the influence of the white paper on human resource development in 1970 uh, by the Department of Enterprise, Trade and Employment which recommended that the expert group on future skills needs to be established. Now, while it does not directly inform Fed policy in Ireland, an expert group on future skills in its annual reports, and it has been reported from 2008 to present, continues to reify the importance of activation and skill measures and steer education on a regular, regulated economic course. In 2012, in Trail, Created to provide all employment related services on behalf of the Department of Social Protection, for example. Also, in 2012, the Policy and Qualifications by the State Body QQI was established, and in 2013, 33 vocational education committees were reduced to 16 under the uh, Education and Training Board Act, where service was established. The new state agency, the Department of Education, is responsible for funding, coordinating, and monitoring further education and training in Ireland. Now, SOLUS was established at a particularly challenging time in Irish history. It set out its first strategy in 2014 and 2019, with rationalization, I suppose, emerging as the uh, commonsensical way of viewing how education could be used uh, to combat uh, the, the, the crisis that we were in, and developing skills was going to be primarily economically resourceful. Skills, resource for economic growth, uh, drivers for employment growth in high skilled areas, means of smartening the economy, driver of social inclusion and social mobility. Having the right skills was perceived as enabling one to contribute to a better society as well as to improve employability and productivity. Undoubtedly, the SOLUS Fed One strategy 2014 to 19 was informed by a strong neoliberal philosophy. And it was further politically influenced by the government's medium term economic recovery plan, as well as renewing EU policy developments such as Human Capital Investment Operational Program 2014 to 2020. So we see a perfect storm at play a crisis 
a movement out of recession, education economy is stringently adhered to, it is backed up and supported by supranational and by the government operation plan. And if you like, from 2012, uh, this kind of moment of education economy linkage is culturally, socially, and I suppose from a from a practice point of view and thinking of professionals in education, massively influential. Massively influential. If you live through those years, we can reflect on that. And the personal profession developing pressures and tensions and issues around all of that. I think that's the point really. If you're a provider or a practitioner in adult education, if you're a learner, in neoliberal times, providers or practitioners are likely to balk at the directive of imposed educational reforms. And the transmogrification of students into data at Thompson Hall and Jones College. Bolton notes how such surrounding cultural structures can adversely impact professional beliefs, values, and identities, and can alienate professionals, particularly in this case, case fed teaching or tutoring staff with deeply held social and altruistic motivations. To exemplify, the 2015 Further Education and Training Services Plan sets forth a proposal for the funding allocation request and reporting mechanism, a national database designed to facilitate annual funding allocations and gather quantitative data from providers, most ETBs, regarding program outputs, defining in numeric terms of how many people completed the course, how many are certified, how many are now in a job. Professional tensions are bound to arise from the need to mediate accountability demands as defined by such narrow outputs and responsibility demands framed in terms of meeting the diverse needs of learners and wider civil society. And this professional question is a particularly modern issue for those working in the field of global education. Now, I'm almost finished by the talk and I just want to refer to Maybe the challenge that's amongst us for the future, and we may be entering a new space. Is this a post pandemic, post neoliberal, post crisis? Because maybe the post crisis thing is not necessarily to hang as yet, given the awful situation in Ukraine and the uncertainty of the world as is. It might appear naive to begin to question this, but importantly, philosophical and theoretical treatises such as the one that we present in the report hopefully asks us to take critique and to imagine our ways, new ways of thinking and doing. And to go back in history and to see some of the lessons that are there that we may learn from. Um, and I suppose I just want to leave with maybe 10 lessons that we've given. And uh, and I'll finish the talk there. But just to say that there are wider disruptive challenges, political instability, centralized marketized reforms, shock waves, the world of work that offers potentials and limitations, and so on. But the 10 lessons that we have, I highlighted in the report that's available in the full report for you, are uh, as follows. Lesson one there's always been a status divide between liberal and vocational forms of education. Uh, FEC must be afforded higher symbolic status, such that it is viewed as a viable and valuable educational option for all social class groups. In our report, we highlight Germany, how vocational education is equally merit with that of liberal classes. Lesson two, adult education and further education providers cannot solely cater for the already educated or trained. Beyond simply progressing learners' further advancement or upskilling, the effect needs to inclusively cater for others. This caring, inclusive, and success for all tradition also needs to be afforded by our symbolic status. Lesson three a more in depth critique of the dominance of the education economy relation is needed. The education economy relation has been built into the work of further education throughout our history, but this has led to increased credential inflation. Formalization of the labor market and the unquestioned role that education plays in serving national and individual market needs. As a consequence, and despite the relative health of labor markets, including boom and recessionary times, social mobility is unproblematically bound up with progression to higher and higher levels of education and training and getting a better job. Lesson four, particular interest groups have always shaped profession. 
from colonial ways of thinking and doing to Catholic Church control the nation state as well as supranational state influences in education affairs. Collective democratic learning partnerships need to be forged that have at their core the needs, interests, and abilities of our diverse range of other learners. This is why the new Department of Further and Higher Education Research, Innovation and Science will need to clearly communicate shared discourse, values, and practices to ensure that FET is authentically represented. FET governments have been traditionally characterized by fragmentation with vocational training, traditionally attached to the Department of Agriculture and maybe the Department of Industry and Commerce, for example, and education, which is traditionally attached to the Department of Education. Uh, they have been traditionally separated out. A significant shift in discourse and culture as well as structural practices is needed for a meaningful effect of integration. Lesson six, there remains a struggle at the heart of this as it seeks to provide for a skilled workforce and still for personal, social, and civic transformation. On an individual and collective basis, it is not sufficient to assume that fulfilling the former will secure the latter. More adequate conceptualization of our education is needed to determine what was and for whom stands. Existing, especially contradictory policy and practices, need to be critically appraised in the interests of consistency and reliability. Lesson seven. I hope this doesn't sound like school teacher for you when I'm giving out lessons 10. Now, this is, uh, this is for you to read and to critically read and maybe reject if you so wish. Uh, can evidence, of course. Okay. Lesson seven, fit partners work best in partnership. It is encouraging to see new intra-governmental partnerships emphasizing conjunctural policy approaches as Charles Alpha talks about, as well as wider stakeholder consultation. Fed developments that are particularly grounded in learners and practitioners' lived experiences are needed. And a learner voice needs to be inserted into the design and delivery of provision measures, and they're likely to sustain. Lesson eight, the FED system is not self-determined. The FED system strongly reflects wider political, ideological, social, cultural, and nature state of changes out there that directly impact it. We need to be aware of those and to avoid, as the early reports, the Kenyan reports, and the Murphy reports, myopic government structures or targets. Lesson nine, the state plays a central role in further education. In contemporary times, this is achieved through increased commitment to act. But the state has a primary responsibility to develop a more favorable equality of opportunity and equality of conditional environment. And lesson 10 strong leadership efforts are needed, particularly now, and this could be sustainably reimagined as part of still the policy course that is more professionally motivated, evidentially informed, and civic rather focused. Now, the reader in the report may pause and reflect on those, offer more, reject some. But the point of the critical appraisal of Irish history is that we don't give through similar reforms that are really just dressed up in new language. That we also reimagine through the critical appraisal of the different epochs, the different interest groups, and wonder where is the heart of that effect of that? Where is it? Uh, on whose side do you stand, as I were good to you know. Um, and the idea of taking history uh, in one's own nation is to better oneself and to become more advanced citizens, to grow up uh, a, li a little more, and to realize that we're not an island either, that there are other fed systems who are doing some amazing imaginative work. And we offer so many in Germany, Denmark, Finland, and maybe other ones that we may not replicate uh, as well. So um, I invite you to read the report in full. Thank you, thank you for your conversation and uh, if we take questions and answers now. And thank you to everyone online for staying on and uh, staying of course. Thank you very much.